The Cavalcade of America, presented by DuPont. past quarter century, the process of invention has changed. The old type of inventor was more or less a one-man organization. If he thought something might work, he tried it alone, working out his results in his laboratory to the best of his own ability. But with the spread of technical education, inventors of this type have almost disappeared. In their place, we have research scientists directing the efforts of trained assistants who have the advantage of technical knowledge behind them. In many laboratories, for instance, hundreds of research chemists are constantly working to improve our way of living. Their aim is expressed in the DuPont Pledge, Better Things for Better Living Through Chemistry. We're pleased to welcome among our studio audience, Mr. Elmer Ambrose Ferry, Jr., son of the inventor. And as an overture, Don Voorhees and the DuPont Cavalcade Orchestra play Whispers in the Dark from the motion picture Artists and Models. DuPont Cavalcade moves forward. (laughs) 
Elmer Ambrose Ferry, was born in Cortland, New York, October 12, 1860. He utilized every opportunity during his boyhood to examine the machinery in various small factories in his hometown. Coupled with his interest in mechanics was young Sperry's precise mathematical mind. And even as a boy, he started inventing things. At 14, for example, a sort of railroad tricycle. And as our story opens, we find him riding this contraption along the tracks in the rolling countryside near Cortland. Much more than that. What do you want? A ride in the cab? No, I want to show you an invention. Oh, an inventor, eh? What great things have you invented, Sonny? Nothing great, but I've made a lot of things that work pretty well. Water wheels and windmills that pump water and churn butter and things like that. <laughs> I'm afraid I don't need any water wheels or windmills right now. But this isn't that kind of an invention. It's something that every locomotive ought to have. See, here's a drawing of it. Well, look at that now. What is it? A headlight that turns when you go around the curve. See these levers connected with the front wheel truck? As soon as the wheels hit the curve, the levers turn the headlight to the right or left. Yeah, what's the purpose of that? Why, it lets you see the, stra the track ahead. If there's something on the track just around the curve, you can see it before you hit it. Well, look at that now. Oh, but say, Sonny, I got to water the engine and get moving. I got a schedule to meet. But I reckon we'll be hearing more about you someday. <laughs> After three years at the Cortland State Normal and Training School, young Sperry followed the call of invention and science and studied at Cornell University, where he received his first impression of the potentialities of dynamo electric machinery. Sperry realized that if certain alterations were made in the dynamo, the output of its electric current could be increased. He tried to interest some businessmen in his plan, but his first demonstration before them was unsuccessful. Now as our scene opens, Barry is talking with a friend of his as he's about to conduct a second demonstration with his improved dynamo. They're on the roof of the courthouse overlooking the crowd gathered in the Cortland Square. Well, Joe, there it is. An arc lamp that really works. And what a place for it, too, up here on the courthouse roof. Everybody in town will see it once we turn it on. Then they'll know what that dynamo of yours can really do. That's right. We know the dynamo works, but we must convince other people. I'd like to get some businessmen interested in my dynamo. It was too bad the last time, Elmer. The arc light breaking down during the demonstration. Yeah, it was my own fault. Say, let's go downstairs and get ready to start this demonstration. There's a crowd gathering. All right, lead the way. Elmer, what do you mean by saying that other demonstration was your fault? Well, Joe, I... I found out that if you want to make sure something will work, you ought to make it yourself. And I borrowed that other arc lamp. That's right. I didn't know anything about it. But I'm sure of this one. I made it myself and made it right. Carbons aren't fixed solidly the way they were in the other one. That was a good idea of yours, putting them in a flexible mounting that automatically holds them the proper distance apart. Well, it wasn't much of a change, but it means the difference between success and failure. This lamp will do the dynamo justice. It's the most efficient dynamo that's ever been made. We know that, but we've got to prove it. And now's the time. Yes, yeah, it's getting dark. It's already half past seven. Well, we're all ready. Come on, Joe. They're waiting for us. It looks as though everybody in town was here in the square. That's right. We better not keep them waiting. The steam engine 
oxygen is all fired, Elmer. You can start any time you want to. All right. She's running fine, Elmer. Yeah. Now for the dynamo. Oh, I only hope the arc lamp works. Oh, it'll work all right, Joe. You watch. There. You see that? Look at that light. Just like day. I guess that'll convince those businessmen that my dynamo works. Look at the way the trees and buildings down the street stand out. Say, Elmer, look at that. You can even read the lettering on old Doc Trimble's window way down past the center of town. Yes, sir. And that one arc lamp drowns out all the gas lamps. Look at the people, Elmer. Grown-up men and women dancing and running around in the light just like children. You can't blame them, Joe. They've never seen anything like this. Why, it's the brightest light that anyone has ever made. As a result of this demonstration, a Cortland manufacturer financed the improvement of young Sperry's dynamo, and the youth went to Syracuse, where in 1880, he built a large dynamo and put his plan into operation. When Sperry was only 20 years old, he founded the Sperry Electric Company in Chicago, and gradually, most of the industrial plants and municipal lighting systems in the Northwest were equipped with the Sperry arc lamp. In June 1887, Sperry married Zula Goodman, and we find them talking on the veranda of a resort hotel near Chicago after the wedding. Isn't it peaceful here, Elmer? It's like being in another world. It certainly is quieter than Chicago. I was afraid you were so tangled up in that business of yours that you might have forgotten how to relax and enjoy yourself. That's why I picked this quiet hotel for our honeymoon. Well, no arc lights here to keep me busy. Nothing to do but sit and look out over the lake and take things easy. Isn't it wonderful? You'll be happy doing that, won't you, Elmer? Why, sure I will. Say, who's that man coming up the front steps? Oh, I'm sure I don't know. He's sitting down. I don't think I've ever met him, but he looks intelligent and energetic. The sort of man I enjoy meeting. I, I'd like to go over and talk to him. Why, of course, Elmer, if you want to. <laughs> I knew you wouldn't mind, Zula. I'll be right back. Well, don't hurry on my account, Elmer. But please, don't talk business. All right. Ah, good evening, sir. Sir? You mind if I sit down? Oh, not a bit. Have a chair. Thanks. My name's Sperry. Elmer Sperry. Glad to know you. Sperry, my name's Sweet. You're not by any chance E.L. Sweet of the coal industry. Yes, that's right. Lovely place here, isn't it? Beautiful. You know, I've always wanted to meet someone in the coal business, Mr. Sweet, but I never expected to do it here. Someone in the coal business? Why? Well, for one thing, to satisfy my curiosity. Has anyone ever used an electric locomotive to pull coal trucks out of a mine? I don't think so. What do you know about electric locomotives? Well, I've been working with dynamos, arc lamps, and electric motors for quite a while. I've got a factory in Chicago making them right now. Well, I thought I was here on a vacation, but you interest me. Electric motor power. Hmm? Tell me more about it. As soon as Sperry returned to Chicago, he launched himself into a career of scientific invention that soon made its effect felt in the development of our country. He invented the electric streetcar, the electric automobile, and his studies in electrochemistry led him towards the perfection of a compound diesel engine. One day, Sperry brought home a new toy for his three sons, a top in a cage, which when spinning seemed to defy the law of gravitation. He returned to his workshop with it, and finally shaped it into an instrument that has become known the world over as the gyroscope. This led to his invention of the gyro compass, the gyro pilot, and the gyro ship stabilizer. And one night, as a great British ship is steaming through the narrow harbor at Southampton, the captain and the navigator are talking. 
Uh, we'll be very lucky if we make it outside, Captain. Yes, I know it. But you saw the orders. Admiralty orders, no less. Proceed at once to the Falkland Islands. With orders like that, you sail no matter what the weather is. Mm -hmm. Couldn't the Admiralty have used better judgment, sir? Our new steel superstructure has thrown the compass needle off 10 or 12 degrees. Maybe more. Even so, we have our orders. Yes, but if we pile up on the beach, what good does it do the Admiralty? Even if we get clear of the harbor mouth, we're bound to run aground on the Isle of Wight. You may be right, but we must take the chance. They're running half speed due southwest for the channel. Yes. By a compass we know is wrong. No. Rather by a compass we're hoping against hope is right. You mean to say we're not using the magnetic compass? What's the helmsman steering by? The very compass. Gyroscopic affair the Admiralty made me install before we left port. You remember we were to have tested it, but we never had the chance. Well, I'm taking that chance now. But, sir, if that gyro compass varies by one degree, we'll pile up somewhere. I'm fully aware of that. I'm hoping that Sperry's gyro compass is correct. Running on an experimental compass made by a fool Yankee inventor. Orders are orders. Quite, sir. I wish we'd run aground and get it over with. Even at this speed, we'd take the bottom right out of her. I do hope there's a chance of the gyro compass being correct. So do I. But I doubt it. It would be nothing less than a miracle if that spheric compass should bring us through. Where do you suppose we are? We ought to be in the channel by this time. Captain, did you hear that? I do think I hear something. Wait a minute. What? It's the first channel, boy. We've made it. Yes. We're in the channel. Helmsman. Aye, sir. We've reached the channel. The first buoy is just off the port bow. Set your course south southeast. Aye, sir. South southeast. There's nothing between us and the Falkland Islands now but fog in the open sea. Aye. Is the course laid? Aye, sir. South southeast. Right. And hold us straight on. And so it was that the Sperry Gyro Compass, in the face of perilous weather conditions, passed a crucial test as the great British steamship, relying solely on its efficiency, turned safely into the English Channel. Gradually, Sperry's invention was installed on a large number of ships. And while the world was watching the progress of aviation, the American inventor was turning his mind toward the development of an instrument that has contributed greatly to safety in air travel. When Sperry perfected this instrument, he installed it in an airplane, customarily flown by his sons Lawrence and Elmer Jr. And one day he takes some friends of his out to a field near his home. Mr. Sperry, I take it you're going to give my wife and me a demonstration. Yes, that was my purpose in inviting you folks out to this field. You didn't think I was trying to sell you this piece of property, did you? <laughs> well, hardly. You're a scientist, sir. We didn't expect to find you a real estate operator. <laughs> Tell me, just what's the nature of this demonstration, Mr. Ferry? Well, you all know by this time that most of our ships are equipped with my gyroscopic compass and stabilizer. Oh, we certainly do. And I've heard that it's proven a great safeguard in ocean navigation. Well, the fact that the United States Navy adopted it proves that. And now that aviation's with us, I've decided to test my gyroscopic compass and stabilizer in an airplane. I see. You've concluded that gravity and direction would naturally be basic elements in navigation of the air as well as the sea. Precisely. And that's what I'm going to demonstrate to you all. Well, this will be interesting, I should say. Now then, you see that airplane just starting over there? Yes. Well, my son Lawrence and his brother Elmer will fly it over us when I wave my handkerchief. I've installed a little invention in the plane not unlike the gyroscopic compass and stabilizer. I call it a gyro pilot. And what will a gyro pilot do, Mr. Sparrow? You'll see in a minute. The boys have been instructed to pilot the plane due west. Then flying low over us at this spot, they'll head directly north. And Lawrence will remove his hands from the controls, permitting the plane to maintain its position entirely by means of the gyro pilot. I think that would be very dangerous. But, Mr. Sperry, that's just a stunt, isn't it? Well, it's more than a stunt, Mrs. Brown. Suppose a plane is flying in a terrible fog. 
Now, my gyro pilot will enable a plane in such an emergency to maintain its position. But Mr. Sperry, that sounds impossible. Then watch closely when the boys fly over us. Lawrence is wearing white gloves, so you can see him take his hands off the controls. Well, you ready for the demonstration? We're ready. All right. I'll signal Lawrence with my handkerchief. There now. Watch him. See, he... Yeah, he's heading west. Here he comes. In a few seconds, the boys will be right over us. Lawrence is following his instructions and is flying low, so you can see him take his hands off the controls. Watch him now. There. See him? Yes. Yes. He's waving both his hands at us. Look, look, the boys are climbing out of the cockpit under the wings. Why, the plane's flying by itself. aware of the future of aviation, fully realizing that a strong factor in its development must be safety. Elmer Ambrose Sperry lived to see that first gyro pilot installed in his son's aeroplane become perfected in the great number of automatic gyro pilots with which the modern airships of today are equipped. Our scene changes to the present day, where in the cabin of a passenger aeroplane, a 12-year-old boy is sitting by himself. The plane is high over Indiana, on its way from New York to Chicago. A door opens, and the pilot comes down the aisle. Well, Jimmy, how are you getting along on your first flight? All right, Mr. Collins. Only there isn't anything to look at except fog. That isn't fog, exactly. Those are clouds we're flying through, but we'll be out of them soon. Well, they're a nuisance, it seems to me. I can't see a thing. Oh, neither can I, even when I'm piloting the ship. Golly, how do you do it then? I don't see how you know which way to go. I wouldn't if it weren't for the gyro instruments and the radio. Gyro instruments? I've heard about them. Who invented them, Mr. Collins? Why, a man named Elmer Ambrose Sperry, Jimmy. Oh, I've heard of him. My dad was telling me about how much he's done for flying, making it safer and everything. Now, your dad's right. Sperry was one of America's greatest inventors. See, I guess he was, all right. You know, Jimmy... We have an automatic pilot in this plane. Mr. Sperry's invention? Right. That's a gyro instrument, Jimmy. What's it like, Mr. Collins? Well, you know what a gyroscope is, don't you? Oh, sure. A gyroscope is just a little top in a cage. I used to have one. You did? Well, that's the same principle as the automatic pilot. I'd show you how it works on our instrument board, but it's against the rules for me to take you up to the pilot's cabin. Anyway, that little instrument's been holding the plane on its course ever since we took off. I see. That sort of makes things easier for you pilots, doesn't it? Well, not exactly. You take my co-pilot, Bill Smith, for instance. He's in the pilot's cabin now. And he's plenty busy. He has to check the engine and operate the radio and do a lot of other things, too. But he doesn't have to lay a finger on the controls now. Golly, that's wonderful. Yeah. We'll be over Chicago in a few minutes, and then I'll take the ship down. You'll meet your father at the airport. I hope he hasn't worried about me. Oh, I guess if your dad had any doubts about the safety of this plane, he wouldn't have let you fly to Chicago. Probably not. <laughs> but say, Mr. Collins, tell me, did Mr. Sperry invent anything else? Sure. He kept working all his life bringing out new inventions. Altogether, about 500 separate patents. Is Mr. Sperry still inventing things? No, Jimmy. In, in 1930, his wife died, and without the care she took of him, he literally worked himself to death. He died within three months after she did. That's too bad. He must have been a wonderful man. He was. He certainly did a whole lot for the safety of travel. Gee, Mr. Collins, the sun's gone down. It's getting dark mighty fast, it seems to me. That's right. Say, Jimmy, come over here. Now watch, right where I'm pointing. There. See it? You bet I did. A bright light that flared up and then went out. There it is again. What is it, Mr. Collins? That's the Lindbergh Air Beacon. One of the brightest lights in the world. It was built for the city of Chicago by... Well, who do you think? Was it the same man who invented the gyro compass and the automatic pilot and all the other things? Yep, the same man. Elmer Ambrose Sperry. The Lindbergh beacon was put there to honor just one man. But somehow it seems to me 
And it honors two. In his long and useful lifetime, Elmer Ambrose Ferry made useful contributions to transportation safety on the land, on the sea, and in the air. Our modern civilization is better and life is easier thanks to his inventions. DuPont salutes Elmer Ambrose Ferry, distinguished figure in the cavalcade of America. At the little town of Bell, nestling in the foothills near the thriving city of Charleston, West Virginia, the DuPont Company has a plant that uses air, water, and coal as raw materials in making 80 different products. Among these 80 chemically created products are ingredients for lacquers, antifreeze for automobile radiators, and a new crystal clear DuPont plastic, the methyl methacrylate resin trademarked Lucite, as well as nitrogen compounds for use as refrigerants and in fertilizers and industrial explosives. Not so long ago, America was dependent on natural deposits found in foreign countries for the nitrogen-bearing compounds so important to industry and agriculture. But the chemist and the engineer, working hand-in-hand, developed a process to extract nitrogen from the air and fix it in a usable form. That achievement made it possible to change what was once a cow pasture into a modern industrial plant giving employment to more than 2,000 people. One of the important nitrogen-bearing compounds produced at this plant is ammonia, which is used in producing a great variety of products, from industrial explosives to fertilizers for the farmer's land. Perhaps its best-known use is as a refrigerant for the manufacture of ice. Many of the fruits, vegetables, and meats you serve are brought to your table from long distances because refrigeration of this type protects them en route and during storage. Through constant chemical research and improved manufacturing methods, the price of ammonia has been reduced 50% during the past 10 years. Strangely enough, from the same basic raw materials used at this plant in making ammonia to freeze water, comes a product to prevent water from freezing in your automobile radiator. It is DuPont Zeron Anti-Rust Antifreeze, used by millions of motorists to protect their cars against winter's icy blast. The annual payroll of the Bell plant is approximately $4 million, and this money earned and spent there does its share to stimulate local business and the general welfare of Charleston and its neighboring communities. Products made there are used by manufacturers all over the country, which means freight for railroads, trucks, and boats, more work for more people. Charleston, West Virginia is one of the 69 communities throughout the nation where DuPont plants are located, plants in which local people serve the whole country by providing, as the DuPont Company expresses it, Better things for better living through chemistry. Bartram's Garden, the story of John Bartram, one of the most famous botanists that ever lived, would be the subject of the broadcast when next week, at the same time, DuPont again presents The Cavalcade of America. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System.